Hello everyone, you are watching Scardia.com. Have you ever seen a patient with swollen feet and were his or her feet were orange too? Or have you ever seen a patient with a swollen thumb only and patient is extreme agony at times? Well, if you see a patient with swollen phosphor tarsal joint with probably an orange peel over the skin, most probably that patient has got gout. And then what is gout? Well, in this topic, we will cover the general aspects of the gout, the pathophysiology and its risk factors, clinical features and investigations. What is gout? Gout is a crystalline deposition disease caused by the deposition of monosodium urate crystals in joints and other tissues can lead to hyperuricemia. Well, if you see it in short, it's actually increased amount of uric acid in our body and that uric acid cannot stay in the blood, it has to go somewhere and if it is not excreted, it goes into the joints and once this modern sodium urate crystal starts deposition, this results in arthritis of the joints. What are the historical perspectives? Well, reports of the great and good suffering of the agony of Podagra from the Greek word foot trap, as you can appreciate over this in this diagram, the classical features of the gout included basically the swelling of the first metatarsal joint. And that was most common involvement or most common presentation of gout. But as you will see later that it is not the only presentation of gout. Term gout, uh, which is from the Latin word gutta, which means a drop. Acute gout in early times being the concept of poison dropping onto the joint. Well, that is what the thought initially the, at the Greek time. In 18, 1683, an English physician, Thomas Sidham, himself a sufferer, actually described detailed clinical description of gout, identifying a number of distinguishing features that we continue to recognize. Coming to the epidemiology, well, gout can be divided into two types, major types. It's primary gout and it's secondary gout. Now, primary gout, as you know, would mean that something is wrong with the metabolism itself. All those chemical reactions which are happening in our body and eventually producing uric acid, that is basically the breakdown of all the nucleotides, the purines and the pyrimidines, which are present in the nucleic acid the breakdown actually produces uric acid. If there is something wrong with this metabolism, this means this is form of a primary gout. But once uric acid is actually produced, it has to be excreted either through gut or through the kidney. And if there is something wrong with the gut or the kidney, as it happens usually in diabetics or certain patients, that their kidney is not functioning properly and is unable to excrete excessive amount of uric acid. So there is actually a relative, although there is no overproduction, but there is a relative increase of uh, uric, uh, uric acid in body and it gets deposited into the joints, which resulting in arthritis of the joint and leading to acute clinical gout. So primary gout, it's 95% is actually absence of any obvious cause due to constitutional under excretion of your the kidney. Do the, and secondary is due to rare hereditary conditions or acquired disorders such as myeloproliferative diseases, diuretic use or renal failure. Coming to the risk factors, what actually cause gout or why some patients actually appear to have acute symptoms and some patients are simply asymptomatic throughout their life and when incidentally the uric acid levels will make it their rocket high. These risk factors actually include family history 30 to 40 percent of the time, alcohol which is quite common especially red wine, renal impairment certain patients with diseases which are like diabetes or hypertension they have a nephropathy associated with their disease so this renal impairment actually also contributes to decreased excretion of uric acid then obesity and other is diuretic use in hypertensive patients certain diuretics especially actually decrease the amount of uric excretion at the cost of excretion of other ions such as sodium that actually causes relative hyperuricemia in body. Now coming to the pathophysiology, as I just told you that uric acid is actually produced as a result of certain metabolism. We have got a DNA in our body which actually contains nucleotides such as pyrimidines and purines. 
Now these pyrimidines and purines have to be broken down into eventually it's broken down into uric acid which gets collected in the cell pool. Now this has to be excreted either via kidney or via gut and our gut actually excretes about 30%. Majority of renal excretion is actually there. Majority excretion takes place through kidneys and that is if kidneys are affected this actually results in hyperuricemia in our body. As you can see in this diagram if you are eating a lot of proteins which actually contains or any diet uh, which is actually containing high purine content especially these dietary proteins will purines will eventually broken down into purine nucleotides and uh, this will eventually increase the uric acid in the upper body as you can see it over here obesity is in the tissue nucleotide synthesis and increased metabolism of these purines which further actually aggravates uric acid in our body and if this excretion is affected for example it could be affected due to certain genetic factors there could be a genetic uh, problems with the kidneys in which they may not be functioning uh, as good as anybody else then there could be a metabolic syndrome such as hypertension insulin resistance hyperlipidemias there could be renal impairment condition in drugs or diseases drugs which also could especially diuretics which can decrease the or reduce renal function so that is actually what all these things actually cause hyperuricemia for any reason if there's a malabsorption or there's a decrease uh, excretion from the gut this will further increase the uric acid pool in our body but as gut is not the major eliminator so it's the kidneys which if gets affected actually are the main determinant of hyperuricemia in our body but if this is monosodium uric crystal is present they cannot just stay in the blood they have to get deposited somewhere so what happens is the joints become the unfortunate uh, uh, you know depositors of these crystals and as a result these joints in our body especially the first metatarsal joint and knee elbow these are not made to deposit monosodium uric crystal as a result once they get deposited over there this results in the arthritis of the joint the cartilage gets swollen the bones swell, inflammation starts to take place and eventually scule of arthritis develop <clears throat> as we know the uric acid was produced in the liver as end product of purine metabolism hyperuricemia uh, which results in higher levels in male it is 420 micro micromole per liter and in females 360 micromole per liter now this is coming to the clinical features what would now remember there is two things there is an acute gout and there is a chronic gout acute gout is the patient presents with a sudden onset of symptoms with pain swelling redness or orangish skin and the patient is quite in an agony at times and usually the joints involved the most common it is your most common presentation is actually the first metatarsal joint as you can see it over here there's a mild degree of swelling there is definitely orange or reddish peel and the, if you would palpate this there would be definitely bogginess indicating that there is degree of edema formation over there asymptomatic hyperuricemia is 10 times more common than gout sometimes the patient comes to you for some other reason they have generalized joints aches and pains and you, although there is no clear cut signs, there is no swelling, there is no crepitus, there is no uh, edema on the top of the skin. But once we get their labs and get uric acid levels, there is rocket high. And that is why that is termed as asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Majority of the patients with hyperuricemia do not develop gout. And gout is actually acute exacerbation of hyperuricemia. 70% of acute gout affects the first metatarsophalangeal joint. That's why it is, was initially called podagra because it affects the foot first. Other features which could include they are usually benign and at night and usually the uh, amount, uh, the increase uh, deposition occurs at night. But once patients wakes up in the morning, the first thing that there is usually they say that there was increased pain as soon as we woke up that was early morning but actually the deposition has increased over night <clears throat> within a few hours the affected joint becomes red hot swollen and extremely painful at times 
patient may be unable to walk or bear the touch of the bed clothes at times the patient is in such an agony that they you know just cannot even withstand slight amount of touch as soon as you just touch them they would like be in tatters at times they would simply cry out of pain because they're so severe at times especially in the first motor tarsal joint that some patients have good threshold they may be in agony but they may not be in so agony that they, they would come to you in your clinic walking and then they would say that okay yes i've got a problem over here my foot is aching and there's a pain there's a swelling but they will be coming to you walking into the clinic sometimes uh, the patient comes in and either he's on crutches or he's been on wheelchair and he just cannot put his foot down and some patients whose threshold is less actually it's quite painful at times natural history is for tag is to settle usually if it's an acute attack usually settles down in 5 to 7 days often with the discomposition of skin of the affected joint but uh you have to take certain precautions you have to take some rest you have to take certain medications so that that eases out as you do 5 to 7 days still will take because the really acute inflammation which is once started that will take time around 5 to 7 days to resolve coming to the uh, investigations whenever a patient comes in we start with the history we have take, seen the examination what would be the investigation in this joint as you see over here in these x rays these x rays of hand of the two patient and can you appreciate these areas this is um, this is actually massive soft tissue swelling and if you see interferential joint between the middle and the uh, distal is actually lost if you see it over here similarly there is uh, the proximal fillings this is the distal fillings if you appreciate there is a nodule are a swelling present and then there are lytic lesions around the bone as well and i cannot appreciate any interjoint space as you can see it over here or over here the joint is probably gone already so this is the classical pictures now there are different uh, you know sometimes the lesion are in different stages of presentation if you see it over here yes there is a swelling there is sclerosis there is some degree of joint erosion but yes i can appreciate some degree of joint is still spared but if you see it over here or over here the whole joint is actually lost so what investigation we you would you go for the most common and the most pertinent would be the serum uric acid level now in case of an asymptomatic they may be raised but in case of an acute gout you yeah, usually or most of the time they are raised now radiographs they are unhelpful in acute attacks either normal or showing soft tissue swelling but now these are the classical if you see it over here now after repeated attacks and if there have been multiple attacks of acute gout then the joint destruction flaring increase soft tissue swelling edema and loss of actually joint space is quite visible on the x rays if you see it here that there is patched out lesion in the right third proximal interferential joint which is over here soft tissue left fifth distal interferential and right third fourth and fifth proximal interferential joint on these then there is sclerotic overhang edges which is the left thumb if you see it over here then there may be a preserved joint spaces and this like in this case but there could be destruction of joint space like over here and over here in chronic gout erosions may be visible it could be in chronic it could be in multiple acute flare ups there is usually edema soft tissue swelling and there is uh, erosions of the joint leading to uh, telltale signs of acute flare ups now this is a diagram which is actually showing what happens in the chronic gout if you see it over here this is the right and this is the left foot and both uh, bilateral involvement is there and can you appreciate there is high degree of sclerosis there is actually hallux valgus and there is this joint space is almost lost if you see it over here there is no erosion joints space is quite clearly visible and it's not distorted as well but on this and this side although if you see this joint space this is relatively better as compared to on this right side 
but erosion soft tissue swelling and destruction of joint space has actually started from here eventually the once this destruction will be complete this may be even after maybe that six months ten months time this would be almost like this there will be complete loss of uh, joint space there will be massive destruction a lot of erosion and probably whole of the cartilage would be lost and it's not very easy then to save that kind of a joint at times on the right side if you see um, this is an histopathological uh, diagram which is actually showing how the monosodium urate crystal actually get deposited into this and this is a joint area there's a cartilage over it and cartilage gets eroded gradually like this and eventually the whole of the cartilage is lost how to make a definitive diagnosis now definitive diagnosis is whenever we were talking about infection unless you do not see microorganisms you cannot say it was definite infection similarly something kind of this happens over here unless you have not seen monosodium urate crystals but they're not like visible to naked eye or even on a simple light microscope we have to have a higher magnification microscopes and then bipolarized light as well in bipolarized light, these slender needle-like projections actually appear white. And if there is negative biofringence, these crystals show under polarized light. If there is in case of a bipolarized light, if you can see, these are showing a negative biofringence. Once we make the diagnosis, once we are suspecting and there is a patient who presents us with acute presentation and there is increased uric acid levels, then we have to start about the management of the cow. Thank you very much.